Uh, so today I'm going to talk about augmented reality and robotics and spine tumor surgery, which are just two forms of intraoperative navigation. This isn't AI, it isn't the robot or the computer doing the surgery. These are just other forms of navigation to help the surgeon during surgery. So one of my mentors was Dan Shuba, and he advocated three principles of using this technology to increase safety, decrease variability, and improve planning. And in terms of using intraoperative navigation, I'm a neurosurgeon and using it is something we're very comfortable with unless you did your residency 20, 30 years ago, uh, we use this technology to help us safely resect brain tumors. And of course, there's a lot of trepidation from surgeons when this first came out, but today with few exceptions, uh, we're using navigation to help us in the operating room. And additionally, for radiosurgery treatment of brain and spine tumors, we use a robotic arm for treatment delivery to help improve accuracy and precision of the treatment. So the next frontier is in the application of this technology to spine tumor surgery. With spine surgery, we first started out with using navigated tools for instrumentation. Then came the advent of robotics where navigated software was accompanied by a fixed robotic arm. And now more recently, we have the introduction of augmented reality headsets where the display is in front of our faces while we're operating. And I've been fortunate enough to use all of these forms of navigation in addition to standard anatomic references. So I feel very comfortable discussing the pros and cons. Uh, with this video, you can see the fixed robotic arm with an end effector or a guide tube, which is used to interface with the navigated instruments. It allows surgeons to follow the same path when they are coming in and out of a field with different instruments. You know, there's minimal skiving, and then the arm can actually just be moved aside, uh, as you can see here, so we can complete the other parts of the case. And augmented reality uh, involves the 3D overlap of the patient's intraoperative CT scan onto their real anatomy, so the surgeon theoretically can just look in the surgical field. Initially, we were using both systems to just put in screws. There are plenty of papers assessing screw placement for both robotic assisted and augmented reality assisted surgery, showing they are like fluoroscopic and freehand. So then why use it? And again, I come back to these three principles. So if you are playing darts or operating, you don't want to be someone who has low accuracy because it isn't safe. A misplaced screw should be a never event. So from that standpoint, anything that increases accuracy increases safety. Hitting the bullseye once is to be accurate, but hitting the bullseye 100 times is to be precise, and that can only come from a systematic approach that doesn't fatigue, which decreases variability. So then we are left with a highly accurate and precise instrumentation. And in the future, I think every single screw that a surgeon places will be recorded and audited to follow and improve the accuracy and precision. And finally, the next step in using navigation and spine tumor surgery is to improve surgical planning. Uh, it was touched upon in this paper that I included here that I really like, and that's what I'm really going to focus on in the following slides and compare robotics and augmented reality. So the strength of the robot is improved planning for less disruptive surgeries, which is important in the oncologic patient population. So this is a patient in his 60s with widely metastatic clear cell renal cell cancer. He was traveled in with lower extremity paralysis, bowel bladder incontinence, and a mid-thoracic century level of over a week. Uh, he obviously needed surgery, but wasn't very healthy. He went for pre-op embolization, uh, and then we used the robot to plan a surgery that would be as minimally disruptive as possible. Uh, this is how the setup would look like in the OR. Uh, this wasn't the exact setup for this exact case. Uh, and if I zoom in on the surgical field, this gives you an idea of, you know, what we should really strive for in patients who may be systemically ill or patients who need to get post-op radiation treatment soon after surgery. And then we can use a navigated probe, osteotome, or drill to assess the extent of our separation surgery uh, while working through a tubular retractor. Um, and then if you, you know, want to use an ultrasound to also assess the extent of your separation surgery, you can do more of a mini open approach to get the probe in. You know, this also cuts the case time down pretty significantly. So we did a separation surgery and fixation two levels above and two levels below. 
Um, he did regain strength back in his legs. He went for CyberKnife postoperatively and he was placed on immunotherapy. Uh, so at Hopkins, we treat a wide range of pathologies for spine tumors. This is an example of a patient that had metastatic dedifferentiated liposarcoma. Uh, he was taken for minimally disruptive separation surgery with percutaneous uh, robotic fixation. And then I just want to point out here, this is one of these constructs where we used a hybrid of carbon fiber uh, and titanium and we augmented our screws. And then this will also be Dr. Mendel, you had asked me earlier about using the titanium uh, rods. So I'll show some of the post-op MRIs. So this was his MRI scan 23 days after surgery. Uh, he was scheduled for radiation treatment for whatever reason about a month and a half after his surgery. Uh, 20 days after that MRI, in the day he was supposed to, before he was supposed to start his radiation treatment, he presented to an outside ED with severe back pain. And the repeat MRI shows significant tumor progression with severe cord compression. So he was taken back to the OR within two months of his first surgery for an open procedure to do a corpectomy with cage placement. And this is his post-op CT myelogram. You know, and in this case, I think they got a CT myelogram because they used a, a titanium cage. Um, so he was started on radiation treatment soon thereafter and systemic chemotherapy. And my point of showing this case is that you know, using robotics is a skill set, and ultimately we still need to balance less disruptive surgical approaches with more comprehensive tumor resections, especially with more aggressive tumors or in patients that you know, are getting delayed adjuvant radiation. You know, this is just one case that I show, but unfortunately, in a lot of places, this can happen more often than not. So the strength of augmented reality is improved planning in terms of tumor resection, particularly in on-block. You know, on-block resections, like we mentioned earlier, they're technically very demanding. Um, they can have higher morbidity rates. So anything that would help mitigate that would be useful. Uh, the first case was completed at Hopkins by Dr. Shuba uh, with a spondylectomy for a lumbar chordoma. And again, this is the view from the headset, and it's great for getting a 3D sense of where to make the most efficient cuts for tumor resection, as you can see here. And they achieved the negative margins. And the other thing to note is that the case took six hours when it usually would have taken them about 11 to 14 hours. So one of the areas where this is already very useful uh, for large sacral on block resections, which are, you know, life saving, but again, very morbid. Uh, in this paper, you can see how having that intra-op overlay really helped with planning efficient cuts, to spare neural elements, reduce spinal pelvic instability. You know, unfortunately, this paper didn't show more pre and post-op imaging, nor talk much about the planning. So I basically wanted to show you this first to just show the, the concept. And with keeping that in mind, I want to go through one of our cases, which is a sacral chondrosarcoma on block resection in a very young active woman, uh, just to illustrate again the benefits of using augmented reality for intra planning of tumor resection. So the tumor encased the left S1 and 2 nerve roots, which are the white arrows. Uh, so those nerve roots were sacrificed in the tumor resection. The L5 nerve root was right at the border of the tumor invading the posterior elements. Uh, you can see it with the white arrow in the bottom picture. You know, typically we would have had to take multiple nerve roots causing severe neurologic compromise like weakness and bowel and bladder issues. Uh, you know, in a young woman who had just presented to us with back pain, uh, and we would have taken a larger portion of the sacrum, further contributing to spinal pelvic instability. You know, however, with the use of intraoperative navigation to prove, improve the planning, uh, we were able to plan exact cuts for a left-sided hemisacrectomy that you can see in the diagram here. Um, and with having that overlapping image in the OR, along with the navigated instruments, we were able to officially execute our plan. So we only ended up taking the left S12 nerve roots. Tumor came out in one piece with negative margins. So, you know, although we can use the CT to help with the, the bony cuts, one con that I'll bring up with, you know, using robotics and augmented reality for the tumor is that at least at this point right now, we can't yet use MRI, uh, at least with the systems that we use. Uh, so it doesn't help as much with the soft tissue release. 
Uh, so we then did spinal pelvic reconstruction with a triple rod construct, uh, three iliac bolts on the left, a fibular strut allograft. Uh, we fit the triple iliac bolts using the navigation. Uh, we put them exactly where we wanted them. Uh, it, there was one that was above our transverse iliac osteotomy and two inferior to that cut just above the spinal notch. Uh, Post-op patient had some mild left foot dorsiflexion and aversion <laughs> weakness, but that resolved. And then at nine months follow-up, uh, she was back to her fully active baseline, no issues with bowel batter function, uh, and her MRI looked clean. Uh, and that's part of the, the power of improved planning. Uh, so Dr. Hartle published this case showing the use of augmented reality pl for planning for intradural spine tumor resection. Uh, they used an overlay of the tumor to localize their tubular retractor placement. So it centered the dural opening right over the tumor, uh, which ended up being a paraganglioma. You know, arguably we can do this without navigation, but it's pushing more boundaries for the use of intraoperative navigation in spine tumor surgery. So that's why I just wanted to, to show it here. So overall, intraoperative navigation has helped to increase safety, decrease variability. With both robotics and augmented reality, um, they've helped improve planning in different ways. The future will be combining both robotics and augmented reality so that we can harness the strengths of both. And the technology has come a long way. We still have a long way to go, for instance, more incorporation of uh, MRI. And, but the only way for it to get better is for surgeons to understand it and to use it and to contribute to its improvement. Thank you. Great job, thank you. So Amanda, so um, where is efficiency in Dr. Shuba's paradigm? How does that fit in? Because what I have seen again is, um, Whenever I visit centers, it seems that I have a bad juju for the surrounding technologies. <laughs> um, and you've worked with me. We are trying to be relatively efficient. So we have, I have three paradigms, compassion for the patient, always, uh, precision efficiency. Where is efficiency in these newer technologies, speaking as an old surgeon who does residency before or uh, prior to 30 years in this whole setup? How does this compare? Where are we in the development curve? Uh, so I think there's already been studies that have been done to show improvement in time for just even screw placement. So I think that's just one where it shows improvement. And I can tell you from watching him do that augmented reality case that I showed that it significantly cut down the time to put in screws. Uh, and then I think, you know, just the fact of, of having the navigation there to be able to help uh look through the anatomy to do a resection because i think a lot of the times especially when we're doing surgery for tumors is you know the anatomy is not normal anymore and we're trying to figure out a way to be appropriately aggressive so we can do the best thing for the patient get the tumor out and not cause us any issues and i think to have that extra piece there uh is helpful and i think in some cases it may make you be a little more aggressive um in, in places that you can uh, and in that way, it helps a little bit more with the efficiency, obviously improves planning. Where are we with using augmented reality or virtual reality uh, devices to actually check the quality of our resection? You're insinuating a little bit. One thing that, that bothers me is, I mean, I just took out a, about a fist size psoas abscess from posterior lateral. I would like to know exactly where I am and we're in a soft tissue environment in this case. I'll show it probably in my presentation shortly. How, how can we check, how can we use these technologies to actually guide us with our resections, decompressions, et cetera? So I think once we start getting to a place with spine tumors as we are with brain tumors, I mean, when, when brain tumor surgery, that's the main point of using uh, the navigation is that we're able to assess the quality of our resection. And I think once we're able to kind of put the MRI scanner, uh, the MRI images for the patient, uh, either on to the robot imaging or into the augmented reality headset, it's gonna be the same sort of situation where we'll be able to go through and look at the extent of our, our tumor resection. I mean, you can do that now. You can take the probe uh, from the navigation probe from the robot, or you can look through your augmented reality headset and you can get an idea. But again, that's coming off a CT scan. That's not coming off the actual MRI. So it's not um, as detailed. Dr. Mendel.
No questions. Thank you. So what what is uh, the most fun thing for you? Is it more navigation? Is it uh, playing in the virtual reality environment with the, like what Dr. Witham has shown us here very elegantly with his uh, interoperative vision portal? What would you do if you're uh, in an ideal world and you could choose what technology you'd want to use? Uh, I want to have them both combined. I want to have the robot with augmented reality because I think it's just, the robot just has so many benefits of having that the fixed robotic arm and then having the guide tube, which is really like a working channel for you to go to go through. Um, and then to have that on top of having the augmented reality overlay, I think is going to end up just being a huge game changer uh, with helping with surgery, these bigger surgeries and patients. So now I'll put your hat into uh, uh, the head of a older clinician. If you could design the future training program for the next neurosurgical and orthopedic spine surgeons, would they be taught in how to do open surgery first and then graduate into NAV, et cetera? Or is this just uh, a fair complaint? It's like telling somebody you got to learn how to use a regular analog phone before you're allowed to start an, an Apple phone. Well, you, you need to know your anatomy. And I can't stress that enough um, because this is still, like I said, it's not AI, it's navi it's interoperative navigation. It, it's a robot. It's, you know, augmented reality headset, it does, it helps the surgeon and it basically kind of does what the surgeon wants it to do. It's not acting on its own. And so you need to be able to know when it's off and to troubleshoot it. Um, and so I definitely think that, yes, you, you can't just throw residents into like, you know, a, an MIS case. I think they really need to be able to have some open exposure. I was fortunate enough that I was at a point where I was still doing open cases um, and I'm in, in addition to doing these types of cases and we freehand at Hopkins. So it was freehanding versus, you know, doing this type of navigation. And I think it's very important. I also would, think, would just say that the fear that completely switching to this um, may cause issues with future surgeons. Uh, may not happen because that was one of the fears when they started using navigation for brain tumor surgery. Um, and, you know, we still have to know our, our neuroanatomy and we still have to know when the navigation for those types of surgeries aren't working. So I think that will definitely be incorporated into residency training. Great. What do you think, Dr. Mandel? Should we proceed?